Okay, today we're going to be looking at minerals and their properties. And most of you have seen minerals and uh, noted that some minerals are very pretty. Uh, but we're going to be talking about uh, the uses of minerals. And uh, at the end, you have a set of unknowns in front of you that you'll be identifying. So minerals are important because all of our metals that we need come from minerals. Uh, this mineral provides most of the iron for the world. Other minerals provide lead and aluminum. Uh, minerals also provide materials like clay to, to make bricks and ceramics or some minerals like this one we use to make glass. Uh, so minerals have our predominant uses in everyday life. And another thing about minerals is they're the building blocks of rocks. So we actually identify different kinds of rocks based on the minerals they're made out of. This one is comprised of pink feldspars and quartz. And when you get that combination together, we call that granite. Uh, other rocks are made of different minerals and have other names. So this one, has, this gabbro has no quartz or feldspar like the granite. If you read your reading assignment, you know that uh, minerals have a kind of complex definition. They're naturally occurring inorganic solids have a constant chemical composition and constant atomic structure. And that's a pretty uh, difficult definition to grab handle of if we don't break it down into individual parts. So the first one has to be naturally occurring. So if you have ice on a pond, uh, that's a mineral. has to be inorganic, so generally it's not made through biological processes, and most minerals don't have carbon in them. Uh, it also has to be a solid, so when that ice on the pond melts, it stops being a mineral and just becomes liquid water. Uh, the fourth part is it has to have a constant chemical composition, so anytime you pick up this mineral, uh, table salt, it's always made of one atom of sodium to one atom of chlorine and it has to have a constant chemical, constant atomic structure. Uh, so that means the atoms are being all the same for each mineral, always fit together the same way, and that results in very distinctive crystal shapes for different minerals. Uh, this one is a rhombohedral, it always comes in rhombohedrons. Uh, this one always comes in cubes. And this one, that you're very familiar with quartz, has a hexagonal or six-sided crystal structure to it. Okay, because of their constant chemical composition and constant atomic structure, minerals also have reliable properties we can use to identify them. One of them is how they break. And some minerals that have no planes of weakness, all of their bonds are equally strong throughout the crystal, like this one, and they break in a random fashion called fracture. So there's no predictable way you'll know what this one quartz will break as. But other minerals have cleavage, and you probably thought that cleavage was how we tell the male minerals from the female minerals. But actually cleavage is a type of breaking because of weak bonds in the atomic structure. And this is mica has very distinctive cleavage. It comes apart in sheets because of that planar weakness mica has. Uh, other ones will break uh, in very predictable patterns. Uh, this is gypsum that also breaks with that cleavage. Uh, another property uh, that makes some minerals very pretty is color. Uh, like this one, the fluorite tends to be uh, purple, but also comes in other colors. And because color isn't a constant, it's not a reliable property. So instead we use a property called streak. And you probably thought streak was what minerals do when they're not wearing clothes, but actually no minerals wear clothes. So streak is what a mineral looks like when it's ground up. And to grind it up, we take so a piece of porcelain and rub this mineral, which is specular hematite that looks very spectacular. Uh, in its native state, but when we grind it on the porcelain streak, 
we see it actually has a reddish brown color like dried blood. Okay, so it's where it gets its name hematite, like the hemoglobin in your blood looks like uh, a reddish brown color. Here's one, a very sparkly metallic mineral called pyrite or fool's gold, and you might be fooled thinking it's gold unless you have a porcelain streak plate. And then if you streak that gold pyrite on it, we can see that it actually has a black streak when it's powdered. So pyrite is very easy to differentiate from gold because gold will give you a gold streak. Some other properties help us narrow down the, the possibilities of the unknown mineral. One of those is hardness. And hardness sounds like how hard you have to hit a mineral to get it to break. But actually, hardness is how easily it will be scratched or scratches other things. And uh, here's graphite on a scale from 1 to 10. Graphite is down at the bottom. It's number one. So you can actually get paper to scratch graphite. Uh, going a little harder, gypsum has a hardness of 2. And it doesn't leave a mark on the paper but you can actually scratch the gypsum with your fingernail. And your fingernail has a hardness of two and a half, so that leaves a white scratch on the gypsum. Other minerals are very hard. They're so hard, they'll actually scratch glass, like this one. That leaves a distinct scratch down there. And glass has a hardness of about five and a half, so almost half of all minerals scratch glass. So don't tell your girlfriend about that. Some minerals have things that will stick to them. So this is a magnet, and the mineral is called magnetite. So it's very easy to identify magnetite, whereas other minerals, the magnet won't stick to. Uh, another property is taste. So some minerals actually have taste, like this table salt. And a final special test is the acid test where some minerals will chemically react with acid. Unlike me, if I put this on this calcite, it actually fizzes as the calcium carbonate reacts with the acid and turns into carbon dioxide. Okay, I mentioned earlier, one of the most important things about minerals is that we can get valuable things we need from the earth through mineral deposits. And uh, many of our important minerals are called ores. If you can make a profit from the mineral uh, by processing it and get what you need, then it's called an ore. And this is the ore of lead. This chemical formula is easy to remember because it's PPS, or lead sulfide. Okay, so we could take this lead ore, galena, and which is lead sulfide, and put it in a furnace to smelt it, so the PBS and oxygen with heat goes off as sulfur oxides and leaves the lead behind. The problem is sulfur oxides are major pollutants because in the atmosphere, in the clouds, they react with water and the sulfur oxides are socks and that makes sulfuric acid rain H2SO4. So what uh, we need to do now when we process these sulfur ores is use a wet gas scrubber which in the stacks causes this reaction to occur and then we can capture the H2SO4. Okay so now you I'll have a set of unknown minerals in front of you, and based on the properties we've talked about, uh, you're going to get your unknowns out and identify what they are.